first of all, uh, I want to thank you uh, all, all of you for uh, your commitment to our intergroup biodiversity, hunting and countryside. And I am not speaking only about my colleagues, but also about our secretary, Face and uh, Ilo, and uh, to all our invitees, particularly our speakers, whom I would like to thank for having accepted our invitation. Hello. Me now a warm welcome to my colleagues and the vice presidents of the intergroup. All of them, but uh, uh, naturally, particularly to Elsie Katainen and uh, Alex Saliba, which are co hosting the event with me. This is the first public, public event from our intergroup in this legislature, and I am very pleased to not that we come back to issues which are of utmost importance for the future of the European Union countryside, like preservation of biodiversity is. I'm looking forward to hear the European Commission's contribution in the person of my uh, Portuguese friend, Humberto Delgado Rosa, that I know very well, it's a specialist, and thank you, Mr. Humberto. Our keynote speaker. I'm also very interested in uh, listening to the interventions of the invited experts. All of them have an inclusive background, and I'm sure they will give us a lot of good food for thought. The publication of the EU uh, 2030 Biodiversity Strategy raised many questions and uh, what will come of it must be seriously anal analyzed if we wish to make the Green Deal a reality for all European citizens, particularly for those living in the countryside. It's very important. Well, but you are here not to listen to me, and I have already spoken a lot. So now I would like to give the floor to our moderator, Dr. Hilt Egmont, Egmont, coordinator of the Belgian Biodiversity Platform and vice chair of the Biodiversity Partnership, which I kindly ask to let the meeting from now onwards. Thank you, Ms. Hilt and uh, good work for all of us. Thank you, Mr. Um, Alvara Moro, for the welcome words to today's meeting. Um, it's also a great honor for me to welcome all of you to today's um, online conference and organized by the European uh, Parliament's Biodiversity um, Hunting and Countryside um, Intergroup. Um, and this looks like a, a great opportunity today for um, land managers and rural stakeholders um, in particular to share their expectations on how to bring the EU biodiversity strategy um, actually in, in, in motion and how to bring also nature back um, into our lives. So indeed, my name is uh, Ms. Hilde Egermond and I will be um, your moderate, moderator of today. Um, this is the first time that the intergroup is actually organizing a meeting uh, for the legislator of 2019-2023. And due to these uh, unexceptional circumstances, it is indeed an online meeting. So it means that we will have to deal with a few challenges that will come with this. But um, I'm confident that with a few ground rules, um, we can make this uh, a very smooth um, discussion. So all the attendees will be in a listening only mode um, and the organizers will mute and unmute um, the microphones of the speakers. So they don't have to bother about that. I would also like to ask the speakers to stick to the time that has been allocated to them because we do have a very busy schedule today. Um, we will also have a panel discussion, um, but I will give instructions on how to engage in that panel discussion um, when we start the, deba the debate. It's also possible that there may be a bit of a delay when we show the presentations, but don't worry, 
um, everything is um, under control. So um, with this, um, I would like to move to the opening speeches by the two vice presidents of this intergroup um, to hear the parliament's perspective um, on the topic. And I will first give the floor to um, MEP Alex Ajus Saliba. Um, so uh, Mr. Saliba, you may now um, speak. Thank you. Thanks, Hilda, and thanks. I would like to thank, before, before I start at the beginning of um, uh, this meeting, I would like to thank MEP Alvaro Amaro and also Elsie Katainen, my two colleague, colleagues, as well as ELO and FACE for organizing this important webinar, which is kick-starting uh, officially uh, the work being undertaken by the hunting um, uh, and conservation um, intergroup within the, within the European Parliament. Secondly, I would also like to welcome all of you and thanking you for joining us in today's discussion to share our ideas and views on how to effectively address the new biodiversity strategy 2030 in order to tackle the crisis over the next decade and also to highlight the important role for landowners and also hunters across Europe in their contribution to promote and conserve biodiversity. The new biodiversity strategy 2030 sets out commitments, measures and also targets to address the biodiversity crisis that we are facing right now. The European Commission presented what should be the new normal that our, that our planet desperately needs right now. The rapid spread of COVID-19 shows an unprecedented global crisis that direct, is directly linked to social and ecological challenges that basically are disrupting our planet. In order to achieve these ambitious goals, the EU and its member states must act without any delay and support these proposals. The main biodiversity goals may only be achieved through um, transformative changes of our society. Therefore, it is crucial to lead our societies in addressing the main drivers of biodiversity, loss such as land use change, climate change, pollution, and also invasive alien species. The first positive element of this strategy is that of increasing Europeans protected areas of land to 30% from 26%, including the proportion of strictly protected land at national level. Unfortunately, until now, Natura 2000 Network has basically struggled to deliver visible results and definitely needs better implementation, innovative elements and support from our local, local communities. The fifth report of FACE Biodiversity Manifesto clearly shows that hunters, together with other stakeholders, such as public authorities, environmental NGOs, research bodies, landowners, farmers and foresters, are very active in conservation of a wide range of habitats and species in Europe. In this respect, Natura 2000 sites demonstrates hunters' commitment to support this important network of monitoring conservation and also restoration. The Nature Restoration Plan, a core element of the biodiversity strategy, will definitely help the decline of many species and habitats and restore them in a healthy way and healthy condition. Furthermore, the Farm to Fork strategy, which was presented together with the new biodiversity strategy of 2030, highlights a number of progressive steps to reform Europe's destructive agricultural practices, which will play a part of the cap reform and contribute to the conservation of farmland biodiversity. The strategy proposes a far-reaching restoration plan in order to restore damaged ecosystems and also to halt, um, to halt and reverse the decline in farmland, birds and insects, particularly and most importantly also pollinators, which are so important in our natural habitats. This is very important because um, they are an integral part of our ecosystem. Without them, many plants, species would decline and eventually disappear, along with other organisms that depend heavily on them. Last but not least, biodiversity loss should be addressed the same way as we are 
also addressing climate change. We need to learn to live in harmony with nature and the next, in the next decade, and this is crucial. We realized that the crisis in the natural world is a, also a crisis for our humanity. We should not forget and learn from the lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic that made us realize how important people's lives are and how fast they can change overnight. I strongly believe that if we act together to reach these long-term goals for biodiversity, we will be in line with the United Nations vision of living in harmony with nature by 2050. Thank you. So many thanks, um, Mr. Um, Agius Saliba, for um, for these words. I think you already pointed to a few key features of the new EU biodiversity strategy, but also to a few concrete challenges. So you have already given us a bit of fruitful thought for um, the subsequent uh, debate. Um, I will now give the floor to um, MEP Elsie Katainen, and this will be um, a video message. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, also on my behalf, a very warm welcome to this seminar. Unfortunately, I'm unable to attend the live event because I'm occupied on my duties as the rapporteur on cap transition and regulation. Regulation which I hope will bring long-awaited legal certainty and stability for farmers and the whole food sector. There are few remarks I want to make on biodiversity and on a new biodiversity strategy for 2030 presented by the Commission. On the main objective, I think we can all agree on, we have to stop nature degradation. The number of habitats is still declining in the EU, which means we have to now act now with practical solutions. Climate change, lack of biodiversity and extreme weather conditions are part of our living and farmers, hunters, forest and land owner, owners are often the ones facing these challenges on the ground first hand. Uh, this being said, I do see some worrying uh, elements in the strategy. Uh, one of the key commitments laid down is increasing the area of land protected to a minimum of 30% in the next 10 years, 10% of which should be strictly protected. What needs to be kept in mind is that the member states vary significantly when it comes to nature. For example, in my home country, Finland, more than 75% of land uh, is covered with forest. Over half of all the strictly protected forests in EU grow in Finland. So we need to make sure different circumstances in member states are taken into account to ensure just and balanced contribution. Secondly, in my opinion, the Commission's approach towards rural actors and rural business is quite narrow. If we want Europe to be leading continent on the field of ecological sustainability, we need to have the social and economic pillar also in the core of the debate. If we ask for environmental resu results for, from farmers, forest and landowners or any entrepreneur, uh, they have to be, have enough field to operate. Without the balance of these three pillars, we will see a lack of commitment and weak implementation. We now have an uh, ambitious uh, strategy, but we also need realism, effective and economically profitable solutions to tackle biodiversity loss. As legislators, we should offer incentives rather than penalties and take into account also voluntary solutions. Lastly, I want to stress that we are talking about the strategy here, which sets a big picture and long-term path. But legislative concrete proposals 
are on the way and as the intergroup supporting rural actors and rural activities, we need to stay vocal and active. Thank you. So now, now, that, that, now that we have heard um, some first reflections from the European Parliament, um, I invite the European Commission uh, and more specifically we welcome uh, Mr. Humberto Delgado Rosa, the Director of uh, Natural Capital, DG Environment, um, to shed light on the new EU biodiversity strategy, which is clearly um, a landmark also um, for and a landmark strategy for the European um, Green Deal. Um, we have Mr. Delgado um, on the phone, so we hope that um, that everything will go smoothly. Uh, maybe just a very brief introduction to um, Mr. Delgado Rosa. So he is indeed the director of Natural Capital at DG Environments, but previously he was the director for mainstreaming um, adaptation and low carbon technology in DG Klima. Um, and he is obviously very experienced in um, European and in international environmental policy, um, and in particular in biodiversity and um, climate change issues. So Mr. Humberto, um, we will now give you the floor and um, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, first of all, to our moderator, organizers, the, the chairs of this intergroup, a uh, special word also to MEP Alvaro Amaro that I know for long. Olá, como vai? Gosto de estar consigo. And allow me to, unfortunately, only my phone, but it, I've done everything, I've tried everything to join the meeting. I was not able. So I will... Uh, need to ask you to change to put my powerpoint on for me and i would hope that you are all seeing the first slide where the title is the UBI diversity strategy for 2030 slide number one i hope tell me if not because i can't see the event okay but the first point i will do on this slide is take note not only to the title the UBI diversity strategy 2030 but also to this important message of bringing nature back into our lives because I think that's pretty much something that interests the stakeholders of, of this intergroup. <clears throat> Can I ask for slide number two, please? Well, mm, I'm not getting my own slide, just a moment. Okay, slide number two. Uh, you should be seeing the European Green Deal and these little flowers, which are the deliverables. Here I would like to, to, to do two important points. One is, although there are many leaves in this flower of the Green Deal, I do think there are two leaves that are politically very relevant and were already referred by the, the interventions before me, which is by one side climate change, which is of course a, a very important focus of the Green Deal, but indeed biodiversity protecting nature has, has raised in political importance when we noticed that not only the Green Deal, actually even the before that the political guidelines of uh, the President of the Commission were putting apart the two uh, issues, climate change and biodiversity loss, as two fundamental global and environmental problems that are closely linked, you can, cannot solve one without the other, that are strongly underpinned by science, that have potentially catastrophic consequences for humankind, and that have win-win solutions to, to be addressed. So I think one of the novelties was this element of raising the political importance of biodiversity, which was also matched by the fact that we were asked as Commission to ensure that EU would lead on biodiversity loss uh, as it has led on climate change in the Paris Agreement. So moving to next slide, please, slide number three. This is to share some words of context on the dimension and meaning of the global biodiversity crisis. Uh, I can tell you, I do follow environmental policy for quite some years now, even two or three decades actually, and I was surprised to see biodiversity hitting the, the, the front pages of the media in 2019, when the IPVS report came out with this headline that we risk, risk one million extinctions in the short run, if we do nothing, and the one that I, am, uh, that I know about likes extinctions. But further than that, also identifying the drivers of loss, both the indirect drivers and the direct drivers of loss. So, of course, if you are to expect 
a biodiversity strategy for the EU to lead by example, you need to expect that the drivers are addressed. I, I wouldn't say all the drivers. We certainly can tackle demography in a biodiversity strategy, but especially some of the indirect and the direct drivers, which are now well known and ranked. First and foremost, land and sea use change. Second, direct exploitation. The third is climate change. The fourth is pollution. The fifth, invasive alien species. So all of this are, must be addressed somehow in a meaningful and ambitious biodiversity strategy. Let's move to the next slide, please. This is the slide, I hope, where you see, see biodiversity underpins sustainable development. It's all also already referred also. Yes, there's indeed some ongoing global crisis for humankind that we can enshrine as we are very far from sustainability. Uh, and biodiversity is not a minor part of that. If you look to the graph at the right uh, in the slide, I like it very much. It came from the Rockstrom uh, Institute, and uh, it shows that within the sustainable development goals that we all cherish, there's a bit of an hierarchy. Or another way to put it, we still have these three dimensions, environment, society, economy, but the biosphere is the only candidate to be the underlying la uh, layer. So life on earth, life on land, land life on land, uh, on the water, are the two fundamental uh, SDGs that sustain the others. And this is, in a nutshell, biodiversity. So its loss, yes, is a key threat for humanity. We strictly depend on nature. The economy depends on nature, as the World Economic Forum has repeatedly alerted us. There's the link I've referred between biodiversity and climate change. And guess what? Also with pandemics, we know the origin of these viruses from zoonosis is nature or the way we, don't, we mismanage nature. And we have also found that mm, proactive policy on biodiversity can help and be a core part of the recovery. So this is to put in context and moving to slide number five, why did it come amidst the pandemics with a slight delay from the pandemics, but still amidst the pandemics? Well, the health links between nature destruction and animal health, human health, so the one health approach, the potential for recovery, and very important, the need to ensure our role in the world ahead of the upcoming summit of the Convention of Biological Diversity that is to come next year in China to give us, hopefully, a new deal for nature, a global deal for nature. Let's move to the next one. And here, uh, getting into the biodiversity strategy, don't worry, because I've counted all the actions within it, and it's more than 100. So I won't go in depth on everything, rest reassured. But I want to share a bit of the elements of these four main chapters on protecting nature, restoring nature, enabling it to solve the change and what you want globally. And I will give some highlights, especially on the topics that may be more interest for you and for the subsequent uh, debate. So let's move to the next slide, which is about protect nature. And here, as we already referred again uh, by one in the, in, of the introductory speeches, we do aim to uh, cover EU land and sea by 30% protected areas effectively managed, integrating ecological corridors to make it coherent and also to allow the due migration of species, namely in context of climate change. And within this, we aim to strictly protect one third of these areas. Now, what is this uh, strict protection? It's certainly not, uh, or not necessarily a don't go, don't touch approach, but it's well identified by science that some ecosystems, including carbon rich and biodiversity rich ecosystems, do require or benefit a non-extractive uh, non approach, meaning uh, allowing ecological processes to go on essentially undisturbed. So this is the meaning of it. All of this is um, well underpinned by science and matching the proposals that we see on the zero draft for the global agreement, which are all also uh, based on science. So this is on what amounts to protected areas. And by the way, it's much more demanding on, on the sea than on land because we are currently around 26% protected areas if you count Natura 2000 and national protected areas. On, on the oceans, we, are, we still have 19% to go. We are at 11%. 
let's move to the next slide. And here, this slide and the next one is on what we call in the strategy, the EU re uh, Nature Restoration Plan, which has 2030 commitments. One first comment on the word restoration, which I find a very key word in biodiversity policy. Because I used to say one cannot build a, a political agenda based on doomsaying or on negative messages only. You need a positive side of it, a side of hope, and that comes from restoration. We can put nature back where we need it, where its services are, are cherished and needed. And that's the essence of the nature restoration plan. Here you'll find first point is the, the first bullet. It's a very important one because we do announce that we will come up next year after a solo impact assessment with legally binding targets for restoration in Europe, which is the first time they come in this format. Further than this, you can find in the nature restoration plan a mix of what I would label active restoration, like, for instance, bringing into a positive trend 30% of the protected habitats and species of the nature legislation. We also have what I would call a passive restoration, which is when you reduce pressures, such as reducing pesticides or pollution from fertilizers, or uh, going into agroecological uh, practices that have less inputs as organic farming. You allow nature and namely uh, pollinators and insects to recover on farmland. So that's another example. I also call your attention for these biodiverse landscape features which is putting back at least 10% of the area with something that Europe has lost extensively, which is the ponds, edges, uh, the trees, the flower strips, and so forth, that are habitat for species, including huntable species, and that were lost uh, in many European fields. So that's, again, an element that helps for some active restoration and also indirect from the animals and plants that benefit uh, from that. I also call your attention to this push for more trees in Europe, these 3 billion additional trees, which is not, let's say, standard deforestation. It's pretty much respecting ecological principles and ensuring resilience, including to forest fires, that will have to be uh, brought into Europe. And in my view, can have also a, a job and growth dimension. Uh, let's move to the next slide, uh, also on Restore Nature. Here I would call your attention by one side for this uh, second bullet, which brings attention, which has uh, uh, brought a lot of attention, which is free flowing rivers also for fishermen for, and fisherwomen is important for anglers, because this is not an immense quantity of you, of you rivers, it's uh, around 1 to 1 1.5%. There are studies underpinning how, we, how and where we can do this, and I think that's uh, an important restoration element. You'll also um, find a strong impulse for urban greening because nature not only exists, but can exist in even further in urban areas where it is much needed and appreciated. So you'll find a lot about that here. I won't, I won't spend more time on the other elements, but we can discuss as needed. So next slide, please. Here, what I want to highlight to you is the following. You do find in the chapter on enabling transformative change quite some relevant points, one of which is this new governance framework that we want to put in place with the member states to ensure that the EU biodiversity commitments, targets, and strategy are duly reflected in national strategies. And this is very much aligned with what we want internationally for the Convention of Biological Diversity. Biodiversity policy cannot just be words. We need measurement, monitoring, reporting, verification. So we aim to get that also within the EU. Second, you will find quite some references to financing, uh, this uh, at least 20 billion euros per year for biodiversity policy from EU funding, national funding, private funding, uh, that you will find within the, the strategy together with uh, this um, trend to tap from the climate target of 25% due to this keyword you find in the final bullet, nature-based solutions. We now know that addressing nature and its recovery often delivers also for climate, be it mitigation or adaptation. So we can as well benefit 
doubly from, from this financing. And there is provisions on business engagement, on knowledge, education, and again, on this wider promotion of nature-based solutions um, that we can all benefit from. The next slide, this one is just a glimpse, a summary of the main elements of what the EU wants to get in a global deal. And to make, to signal the main points in my view here are these goals and targets quantified that allow for a much stronger implementation, monitoring, and review. It's pretty much something that the international biodiversity framework will need and that we hope to get with all the points being important, of course. But I won't uh, go much in depth here, also for the sake of time management. So next slide. Uh, still on the global side, here I highlight the link with the SDGs that I have done already, and elements uh, such as trade policy, which is referred not only in the Green Deal, also in Farm to Fork, and also in the biodiversity strategy, as needing to fulfill more its role for sustainability. So we will aim to address, for instance, free trade agreements in a way that ensures a level playing field with our with our own approaches within the EU. And of course, we hope the biodiversity strategy to be influential for international cooperation, not meaning that one size fits all and EU solutions must be the solutions of the others, but for sure we need to address unsustainability everywhere, on farmland, on soils, on the oceans, everywhere we find it as diagnosed by science. Next slide, and I'm almost finishing. Here it's a glimpse of the next steps. We are moving into implementation, planning the implementations, first within the commission, within the services, then we will, of course, have to address stakeholders, mem member states, etc. We uh, cherish the reaction from the parliament, from the council and the committees of the regions, the, the economic and social committee also. There's a summit on biodiversity scheduled for September around the UN General Assembly. And we are waiting for uh, the final confirmation of the date of the CBD COP15 that should agree a new global framework for biodiversity. Next slide is a summary of main points I've referred, just to put them in your mind in case you want to debate these ones or others. And uh, the next slide is the final one, just to thank you. I hope that I haven't taken much more time than attributed, and I'm eager to discuss and to get your questions. Thank you very much, and over to our moderator. I hope. Oh, sorry, yeah, okay. it took, yeah, it took oh, a no. bit of time to to unmute me, but uh, I'm back. So thanks a lot, Mr. De Gada Rosa, for presenting the EU biodiversity strategy in a nutshell. Um, there's clearly a lot of ambition, indeed, that speaks from the from the strategy, and it's also clear that Europe wants to be a leader in the global scene, um, and more specifically in the context of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework, that, as you said, will hopefully be agreed on next year in uh, Kunming. Um, and we also heard that there are very a lot of concrete um, and ambitious objectives on the table, uh, which means that um, some trade-offs will need to be um, considered. Um, and so that clearly paves the way for our panel discussion. So I would like to propose that um, if there's any question for, um, for Umberto, that we also um, put that forward during the actual um, panel debate, because that may ease um, the discussion. Um, and so for the panel of today, um, I'm happy to welcome three panelists who will each give their views um, of their organizations on the EU biodiversity strategy. Now, each of these panelists will get 10 minutes um, to present. Um, and after that, we will open the floor for questions. Uh, MEP will have the priority to intervene and they will also have the opportunity to pose their questions orally. Um, so we ask those MEPs who want to speak, or whether it is a question or maybe a comment, to just click the raise hand button in the right um, top right uh, corner of your screen. And we'll, we will then give you um, the floor after the three presentations. And we would also like to ask you to restrict your intervention to um, one minute, because we do want to give everyone um, the floor. 
Um, and also while the three panelists are presenting, we also invite stakeholders to write their questions in the question tab. Um, and so after that, after our panelists have answered the questions from the MEP, I will transfer some of these questions also from the stakeholders to our panelists. So stakeholders don't need to speak up, but they can put their questions directly in the question tab. And due to limited time, uh, we cannot guarantee that we can um, answer all questions, but uh, of course we will do our very best. So now um, I will present you the first um, panelist, which is Mr. Kim Friedman. Um, Mr. Friedman came into the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, um, from Australia in 2015, um, with experience um, of leading fisheries and environmental teams across Oceania. So he has a lot of um, expertise in that field and his um, responsibilities at the FAO currently span both fisheries and environment um, as fisheries national focal, uh, focal point for the CBD, also fisheries focal point for CITES and also in providing the FAO fisheries and um, agri the agricultural department support for the rollout um, of the SDGs. So uh, Mr. Friedman, the floor um, is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Base and Elo, and thank you, Ms. Hegemon, for the introduction. Hopefully, you can see the presentation. If you could just put your thumbs up. Yes, we can see it. No problem. Okay. Thank you. So a little bit, a little bit about the lens through which I see the world. I'm not an EU biodiversity strategy expert or a land management expert, but what I'd like to share with you is general approaches to improving people's relationship with nature, but offering a marine management perspective, which is my background from working across fisheries, aquaculture and marine parks. Okay, the way we think about nature is changing and this is important. Let's step back and examine how we think about nature through time and that will help us to understand how we're going to approach conservation. So ways of thinking change markedly through time and such change happens over decades. Initially we're looking at balance and stability, an idea of divine balance, nature and equilibrium, but by the 1950s we very much began to understand that there's a much more complex and dynamic picture to nature through collecting empirical, uh, empirical evidence. And this brought us to a feeling of more systems approach to nature, but also including the social with the ecological elements. So a social ecological system. So where we started from was a nature and people divide and where we've come to is much more of a systems approach with nature and people together. So this relates to questions on how we approach opportunities to ensure in to get to this enduring change. An American philosopher, John Dewey, once said, a problem well put is a problem half solved. So you don't always know the answer, but framing the question correctly can be helpful. So let's have a look at the frameworks that we use, the triple bottom line of sustainable development. We all know about that. It, it, part of our SDGs, people, planet, profit. And through time, we've started to realize that more and more, we're not looking at this from a perspective of, of activities based on people, planet or profit, but we need to work right in the central, central area. If we're gonna turn around this big ship that we're in at the moment, we have to work in the center spot. And you can see, you don't really need to, um, to go through each of these, but you can see we're at a crossroads in the evolution of change management in global frameworks. We're struggling to become thematic rather than activity focused, to look across systems instead of being siloed in these single boxes. And in order to achieve the policy and practice that will achieve change, we see this cannot be done alone. We have to work with all stakeholders that each need to be part of the solution. And the EU's Marine Strategy Framework Directive in force since 2008 also promotes that ecosystems approach, similar to how the CBDs moved from their decade on initiative 2011 to 2020 to a post 2020 framework that has more human elements in the overall design of the zero framework. UN, UNFAO's ecosystem approach 
and obviously the biodiversity framework that EU is putting together now. So let's have a look at how this lays out. You don't have to look in the individual boxes, but such changes reflected in the agreements of UNGA, FAO member countries and the international community, but they are hard won. So for example, if we look at FAO, FAO was there rather early with the ecosystems approach around the, two, uh, around the 2000s. CBD in its post 2020 outlook is looking for more balance across the deliverables on species, ecosystems and people. And I guess the take home message here is that small steps are not visible on three to five year project cycles, but major shifts are occurring over tens of years. And with the EU biodiversity strategy, you're lucky enough to be in the right place to support such progress in policy and practice. So is the EU biodiversity strategy asking the right questions in considering spatial management in order to achieve productive and sustainable social ecological systems? Let's look at this, let's consider this from a traditional biodiversity conservation approach. And here on the left hand side, you have half a pyramid from a global mitigation hierarchy for nature conservation, starting at the bottom at the base with avoidance and moving up through minimizing, rectifying, remediating and offsetting. And you can see the, the weight that's been put on this avoidance, um, which is largely linked to MPA and um, to protected areas. So does this pyramid prioritize the right mix of exclusionary and inclusive approaches for actions on reversing biodiversity decline? And what we find now is that there's a bigger, bigger push to get more and more area into protected area. And when we looked at this from a marine perspective at the last Oceans Conference in 2017 and got the experts together, um, they recognize the challenges in creating protected areas in isolation from human disturbance, noting that climate change are experienced at scales larger than the spaces protected and many species, especially in the marine environment, are mobile. And what they pointed out that biodiversity hotspots are generally the same places that are socioeconomic hotspots. They are centers for human use. That's challenging when you're trying to put in MPAs. The geographical distribution of protected areas in the marine domain were very uneven with a small number of carry, uh, countries carrying most of the area. And lastly, and importantly, management effectiveness of protected areas in the marine environment remained one of the largest problems. Okay, let's move now to a more postmodern paradigm of a conservation approach, considered through, through the lens and the need to co-opt the use sectors into biodiversity mainstreaming as they also have a, globe, uh, have a goal of productive and sustainable ecosystems. So this, this model that is typically used in use sectors is not centered on avoidance. There's much more work done on rectifying, minimizing and remediating, much less on avoidance. And the presence of other effective area-based conservation measures in the CBD 2011 to 2020 IHE targets and proposed for the post-2020 framework opens the door to a much broader range of actors being recognized in spatial management initiatives, many of which are presently disenfranchised when asked to participate through protected area designation alone. So what we're looking at is trying to shift effort up this mitigation pyramid to where the bulk of the people-nature interactions occur. Definitions, and criteria for these other effective area-based conservation measures, OECMs, were defined by the CBD, the Conservation of Biological Diversity, in late 2018. And there are allied UN initiatives, for example, the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, an initiative led by FAO and UNEP. So like the EU, EU, like the EU um, CBD, FAO and UNEP are working to engage, educate, encourage, and importantly, empower broad range of participation into action. So in closing, we need to firstly recognize that productive and resilient ecosystem functions are foundational for culture, food production, livelihoods, and biodiversity conservation. We need to recognize the value of more inclusive spatial management approaches as recognized by the conservation of biological diversity. We need to recognize these new 
mechanisms such as other effective area-based conservation measures and what they offer us. Let's have a look at what they do offer us compared to maybe a more strict protected areas approach. OECMs can typically be implemented within biodiversity hotspots where protected areas are not usually politically achievable. Other effective areas conservation measures offers a broader community of practice plus extra connectivity pathways across land and seascapes, joining no-take protected areas, for example. OECMs don't require ownership to be handed over to environmental ministries and do not need coherence across all of government ministries for establishment, a requirement that can make protected areas unattractive or significantly delay gazettal of protected areas. And use sectors often have expertise already on the ground and on the water with a funding structure for implementation that is proving to be a significant challenge for government and NGO funded protected area ventures in the longer term. And finally, we need to ensure that preservationist, conservationist and management approaches are all valued in our planning and given recognition and incentives to encourage positive behaviour. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Friedman. Um, it was very insightful that you shed light on the different approaches to biodiversity conservation and use, um, and especially also to the potential of other effective area-based um, conservation measures uh, that might indeed be a good tool for reconciling uh, the protection of biodiversity with um, other interests. Um, so now um, I will move to the second panelist, which is um, Eric Harrison. Um, and Eric is um, working in the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services program of the Institute um, for European Environmental Policy, the IEP, um, which is a sustainability think tank cooperating with a wide range of stakeholders um, on evidence-based research and policy um, insights. And that specific unit, uh, this biodiversity program unit, um, aims at improving EU nature and biodiversity policies and also aims for a very positive um, integration with other um, EU um, policy objectives and strategies. And before joining the IEP, Eric worked also in the natural resources team of WWF uh, European uh, Policy Office. So, Eric, um, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Thank you. Mute myself. Uh, thank you very much, Hilda, and thank you very much for the intergroup for having me uh, today. Um, I'll just find my back my presentation. Uh, I hope you can see it. Um, um, just uh, yeah, briefly to recap, um, because not everyone may know IEP, but we're a sustainability think tank um, uh, covering many policy areas for many years and we have a long established biodiversity and ecosystems program um, and have been involved <coughs> in the development and evaluation of, uh, of EU biodiversity policy in, in different ways including also the uh, previous EU biodiversity action plan and uh, the, the, the strategy to 2020. Um, uh, I will keep it short and uh, also will keep it short on my second slide uh, which uh, uh, shows this graph of this uh, Stockholm Resilience Center which is already shown. Um, just to emphasize again um, that all our development objectives uh, including EU policy objectives depend on healthy uh, ecosystems uh, or natural capital in econ economic terms if, if you wish and biodiversity is the clockwork that keeps that going. So. Um, and it also uh, makes it important that uh, it's recognized as a, as a cross-cutting uh, priority policy objective. Um, uh, and that has not been uh, the case in the past in, in EU policy and decision making. So um, when you look at the title of the new uh, st proposed strategy for the EU to 2030 uh, and the its title bringing back nature into our lives, uh, I think the overall impression of the new strategy and also it, it being such a central part of the, the new growth strategy is a very important signal uh, for the next decade, um, which does give hope um, 
and also uh, more purpose uh, for ourselves and also very broad um, uh, very broad support base because everyone will find uh, something in it uh, in restoration so um, I uh, apologize for taking a bit of a technical slide um, uh, from my home country of the Netherlands to start uh, my point on nature protection. Um, the graph on the left uh, with the blue uh, co uh, columns shows uh, the grassland butterfly decline in the Netherlands uh, over the 20th century. Uh, so you show, I think, shows very much um, the historic decline of, of much nature. This is one example because we have such long data uh, on grassland butterflies, but it is good to, to keep in mind this long-term uh, perspective. So do I um, have... Sorry? Um, on the right side, um, there is um, uh, the combined species populations um, since the 1990s uh, in different uh, places. Uh, the first graph is in protected areas, second in, uh, in uh, farmland areas, and the last one in cities. So what you see is that uh, roughly since uh, 2005, we see that we in protected areas uh, have turned around uh, the ongoing declines. It's not butterflies, it's all species for which there's reliable data. So, um, but I think there's a very positive story in it, in the in case of Europe, that we have been able through protected areas, and also maybe in defense of the old traditional protected area policy, uh, that we are able to turn um, these trends around with the targeted policy. Um, and um, I would really recommend you to read this report that uh, IEP did with many partners uh, for the European Commission not so long ago. Um, where we looked at hard data on uh, conservation improvements of habitats and species, and and went and and looked into what are the the, the, the success factors that um, that can explain these these positive trends that we see in some places. Um, um, so they are all listed here. Uh, I will not go uh, through them all, um, but I think um, in relation to um, the countryside. Um, I think it's very important to mention the, the monitoring and the evaluation of, of measures in, in, for example, in farming and in forestry, uh, to bring stakeholders in management planning, um, and uh, yeah, and to uh, also ensure sufficient funding is in place. But we'll get back to that. Um, so just to look at the proposed strategy, I was asked to reflect on. So the targets uh, there. So um, I think the, the, the protected area target um, of 30% of protected areas in the EU, when you look at the current uh, status, it's already at 26%. So I think in terms of land-based protection, it's very feasible. But I think as also was mentioned by the Commission at, at CIS, there is a, a big remaining challenge. Um, then I think the strict, the the, uh, the proposed commitment to have uh, strict protection in a third um, uh, of protected areas, um, I think is, is also, yes, in the European uh, context, also um, supported by evidence. Um, um, but I, I just wanted to make some points, I think, which are good to keep in mind, I think, when doing this in practice. Uh, first, I think, is that, um, maybe rather than the target being leading um, to, to focus on the established conservation objectives that we have locally now for an increasing number of uh, protected areas um, and to support the, the measures proposed uh, uh, by good monitoring evidence um, and also to uh, bring in stakeholders through site management to implement this in practice and uh, uh, without losing ambition be flexible where where you can, um, keeping these conservation objectives in mind. Um, but I think, as as mentioned uh, from the commitment mentioned, I think the 
the improving of management effectiveness is the big opportunity uh, at sea, but also certainly on land. So, um, we've just finished a scoping study for the EA, which is not published yet, but uh, one of the key findings is that um, uh, there's a lot of um, helpful guidance, uh, evidence of, of uh, what has worked, but it needs capacity building um, with site managers, with authorities, uh, and also even at the EU level uh, in the Commission, for example. So, um, I have to move on uh, to the restoration uh, plans. Um, yeah, um, the, I do not have time to go in all the tar targets, but there are many proposed. Um, um, I think our main impression is that um, there are many good ones and their integration is, is key with other initiatives, such as the farm to fork strategy. Um, and for example, the target on 10% uh, of high diversity uh, areas on farmland was not in the farm to fork strategy, which is a missed opportunity. Uh, but more broadly, we feel that, um, well, the Commission has moved fast now with the strategy, but uh, there's still quite a lot of work to be done to to ensure buy-in for future restoration uh, agenda and avoid the lack of buy-in that has hampered um, progress uh, in the current or in the expiring strategy to 2020. Um, and then uh, another in, um, impression is that there are, uh, of course, many uh, different um, areas of attention in the in the strategy. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we agree that um, I think was also mentioned in the previous presentation. We need a broad, um, a broad movement, and not only in protected areas, but uh, across the board. But at the same time, we find that um, prioritization will also be important. And the EU has already developed guidance on on what would be kind of the the most uh, useful and important projects from an EU perspective. Um, and that I think is good to keep in mind um, also in future work on, on consultation and impact assessment. Um, then um, the uh, fourth key issue is, is uh, investment, obviously. Uh, there's an, um, an estimate of 20 billion uh, in the strategy, but there's, um, compared to the evidence uh, on current um, investment, uh, there's not very much detail on, on how this can be met, and that needs to be done quite quickly. Uh, now that there seems to be an agreement coming on the MFF, uh, so the EU's long-term budget, um, there is a need to, I mean, the, the programming of different uh, investment streams uh, will speed up. Um, uh, member states have uh, indicated their investment needs for nature uh, and biodiversity and restoration in their um, prioritized action frameworks. Um, and. Uh, this is really the time to make sure that these investment needs are met um, concretely in the programming and especially in relation to the CAP uh, strategic plans. Um, I have to conclude already, but maybe in the discussion we can um, uh, go into more detail on, on specific commitments. Uh, but in conclusion, uh, our impression is a very ambitious, uh, constructive and coherent strategy um, also presented at the right political level, um, but various commitments need more detail um, and maybe better reflect uh, available evidence of, of successful implementation um, on priorities for EU level, uh, for mainstreaming in, uh, with other objectives uh, such as food and farming, um, and also in terms of uh, governance, and to make sure that this will deliver uh, without um, you know, antagonizing key stakeholders. Um, and lastly, uh, yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, I think it's it's really urgent uh, at this point um, uh, that the, in the EU institutions, not only the Commission, but the Council and Parliament, um, will support uh, a proper consultation, and making sure this is seen uh, and discussed um, quickly and in more detail to, to make sure that it's we can all do our part uh, to make this work. Thank you. Thank you, um, Eric. I think it was very relevant that you also pointed to uh, the EU conservation success factors and some lessons learned from the past, um, and also the need indeed to be flexible and to prioritize while um, not losing um, our ambition. 
Um, now, before I move to the next speaker, I would just like to remind the MEP that if they want to um, raise a question after, um, during the panel de debate, that they can de still just raise their hands um, in, the, in the box, and then we will give them the floor um, after the last presentation. And the last presentation is a presentation by Jürgen Tak, who is the scientific director um, of the European Landowners Organization that is um, actually supporting the work of this intergroup as a co-secretariat with um, the Federation for Hunting and Conservation. Um, Jürgen is a marine biologist by training, but he has lots of experience um, in European and international science policy. Um, he was the former um, CEO of the research um, Institute for Nature and Forest in Belgium, and he, um, in 2016, he took the position of um, scientific director at the European um, Landowners Organization. So, Jürgen, um, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Thank you, uh, Hilde, uh, dear colleagues, panelists, uh, members of the European Parliament, and those who are listening uh, in this late afternoon in the meantime. I would like to start my, my first slides with a series of dates. And uh, I would like to mention 2000, 2010, 2020, 2030. And let's say uh, those uh, four dates were not chosen because they are ending at a zero, but those dates were chosen because in each of those years we have had internationally or at a European scale a biodiversity strategy. And uh, while in each of those strategies, we see the numbers increasing, the objectives uh, increasing, I have to come to the conclusion also that we still have to fulfill quite a number of the objectives of the year 2000. And no, we did not halt the loss of biodiversity in 2010 and also in 2020, quite a number of objectives of the European uh, biodiversity strategy are still open and are not reached yet. So it is a pity that despite the enormous increase of the global budget and the increase of land surface for nature conservation, we have to make the constatation that biodiversity is de still declining. And then we have to ask ourselves the question whether we still have to further augment uh, all of those uh, figures or whether we have to invest in the real problems that remain the most pressing ones. And it's easier said than done because then we have to find out very clearly, of course, what those problems are. Nevertheless, I have to say uh, my organization, the European Landowners Organization, we welcome the new strategy of the European Commission, but we have to be honest. We're also a little bit critical because we do think that the strategy should not become the objective, but that the objectives should be reached. In the next slide, I would like to speak a little bit about the role of private landowners, uh, including foresters and farmers owning land uh, and managing land. The good thing about the next uh, EU biodiversity strategy 2030 is, well, we want to go up to 30% of protected areas. And that's something we are not going to be able to do without the inclusiveness of all stakeholders and specifically of the private landowner. Knowing that private landowners own up to 90% of, of the land surface and uh, are owners of up to 60% of the Natura 2000 areas, there is no sustainable solution that can be achieved without landowners and an efficient land management. Now, we have seen that during the past decades, and especially uh, during the last years, that the contribution of private landowners and managers have been progressively recognized at the EU level, but we still see some room for improvement. If we take, and that's something we see on the next slide, the three pillars of sustainability, the economy, the ecology, and the social uh, aspects, then we want to reach economic viability, we want to protect the environment, and we want to take care of social equity. And without taking into account those three pillars, we are systematically, we have proven that we get disappointing results. So we should certainly not make that mistake 
in the future and we should make you should make sure that the three of them are clearly linked with each other and for that to reach that i think it's of the extreme importance for my organization that qualitative and effective management should be absolutely at the center of the eu strategy and we sometimes have the impression that the quantitative part is becoming more important than the qualitative part and we do stress that absolute uh, that we have to reach minimum qualitative levels even if we put quantitative objectives as i said landowners should be i would say a natural and maybe a preferent partner at the eu level what we have seen thanks to studies we have been able to do within a life uh, a preparatory life project lent is forever uh, we have seen that voluntary measures and contractual agreements not only have proven to be very effective but let's say that private landowners are very are showing a great interest in working with this kind of instruments and it's exactly for this reason that we at ELO recommend choosing a wide range a menu of voluntary tools for the conservation of private land at the EU level On the next slide I would like to speak about the strict protection proposed within the EU biodiversity strategy. Uh, a figure of 10% uh, is put forward. And we have, first of all, a number of questions about uh, this figure. And the first question is if this target involves the total abandonment of economic intervention. Um, because we do believe that strict protection is quite leading, it's often leading to the opposite of what we intend to do and what we have seen in the past and if we look at large private properties that is that strict protection sometimes prevents the adoption of the management done uh, at the land and for many sites species and habitats present some of them really depend entirely on the pursuit of a certain management activity for their long-term survival. It's something we see, for instance, in the forests. If we keep on going with only making use of, of local species, uh, and at the same time you have climate change, then in the long end we are going to be to have a major problem uh, for our forest to survive. And there we see exactly opposing targets between climate change actions and biodiversity actions. For the next slide, uh, I would like uh, to focus on the work with farmers and to, en to enable them to participate that we need adequate incentives to improve biodiversity. And let's say we have seen in the past years payment for ecosystem services as a very important and as a very promising way of, of, of handling this. And so we regret that this measure is not even mentioned uh, as an essential uh, part of the EU biodiversity strategy. Um, we also would like to understand how the suggested target of 10% agricultural area under high diversity landscapes will be designated and articulated with the new common agriculture policy. Because it remains unclear whether this will be included in the eco scheme as, uh, architecture, and it's certainly unclear to us how it will be paid for. Now, the EU biodiversity strategy also refers to a reduction of chemical pesticides, and we are very much in favor of that on the condition that this go hand in hand with the development of more env environmentally friendly alternatives so that we can enable farmers to ensure Europe's and the world's food security, an important goal for many of the private landowners active in farming activities. On the next slide, I would like to come back to the instruments um, and we are asking the European Commission to improve the use and adoption of existing financing mechanisms to boost actions linked to biodiversity. Uh, I think within DG Environment they will be happy to hear that, but okay, of course that is always linked with budgets of others, but this is really a necessity. And as I said, uh, we, we are running uh, the, life uh, the preparatory life program, Lent is Forever, in which we have reviewed existing and innovative mechanisms 
at the moment used in one or more EU member states. And we are able now to present the European Commission a list of tools that can be supported from individual landowners' perspective, but tools that can support the European Commission uh, reaching the 2030 targets, as mentioned in the EU biodiversity strategy. And those tools are including payments for ecosystem services, they include tax benefits, labels for nature conservation management, or durable natural products, uh, and all of those are being explored in this project. I will come to conclusion because I see that I'm more or less at my 10 minutes and that we see in the next slide. And let's say, first of all, I would like to remember that all of the measures proposed under the biodiversity strategy, under the Farm to Fork strategy, under the CAP, they will ultimately be on the shoulders of individual, usually small single family farmers of, or forests who are already managing the effects of climate change on their activities. And we have to keep into mind that they have to do the job in the field. Now, ELO is certainly ready to actively contribute to this dialogue. We do think that land managers and landowners can only be asked to invest in biodiversity if there is a real return on investment, at least partly, benefiting those also realizing the EU 2030 biodiversity strategy targets. Uh, just to give you an idea how we can go to 2030, uh, and we can go to the next slide. Uh, and I already mentioned the need for private land conservation tools as they were developed and studied in the Land is Forever project. And we see some of them in the next slide. Now, this is just giving an overview of the very different voluntary conservation tools and incentives already existing somewhere in the European uh, Union. And we do think that just by multiplying this towards other EU member states and even at the European level, that we can make sure that private landowners can contribute significantly uh, to the EU biodiversity strategy. And in the last slide, I would like to mention one more specifically, a voluntary, uh, the, a voluntary tool, which is the wildlife estates label, and which is really giving a label to private landowners which are active in biodiversity and are acting on and towards the EU biodiversity targets as set in the strategy 2030. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jurgen. I think you made a very clear case that the um, success of the EU biodiversity strategy will strongly also depend on the engagement of rural actors and that we need incentives and a return on investment for these actors um, to engage. Um, I think we can now move to the to the questions. Um, we didn't see any um, hand being raised by the by the MEPs, so uh, we will move straight forward with um, some questions that we received in the chat box, and we will start with um, two questions for Umberto. Um, uh, one is short, and the other one is a bit longer, and I will start with the shorter one. Um, and the question is, how will the European Commission increase the implementation efforts? Umberto, I don't know if you want to respond to this one. Maybe you want to read me the second one also and I reply yeah, to both? Yeah, I will do that. No problem. Um, so the second question um, is, um, it is good to see that the Commission has included other effective area-based conservation measures under Protect Nature, um, but has the Commission also looked into how these will be used to deliver on the targets? And um, have they looked into how they have been used globally? And will the definition of the OECMs in the EU strategy be defined in the same document as the one used to define strictly protected areas? Well, thank you very much. I will reply to these two questions and maybe I could react a bit also to some points I've listened from the other speakers. So I'll try to do it quickly, but in a row. First and foremost, on in terms of implementation and enforcement, uh, that's also in the strategy. We do, we will indeed increase our efforts of enforcement to begin with of the existing legislation. 
native legislation, water permit directive, marine strategy permit directive. And indeed, the, the implementation is key. That's something we are pursuing since the nature fitness check that it has identified that Natura 2000 or the birds and habitats directive remain fit for purpose. But uh, they indeed, they, they miss implementation. We have had this nature action plan precisely for that. Now, on protected areas and OECMs, and reacting also a bit to the debate, it's not an issue of either or. We've listened clearly from Kim, from Eric, how both OECMs and protected areas can deliver. It depends a lot on the approach, on the concrete case, also on the management. Let me also just signal another issue. I've often listened to strict protection as meaning no management. I don't agree. I think that strict protection is a special case of management where you may need including to take management actions to control visitation, if it's excessive or not, to remove invasive alien species and India to ensure that nature fulfills its role. So I don't see this as an either or, but just as a special case of, of um, protection that for some ecosystems it's actually needed. And also I don't see at all a contradiction between biodiversity, including in strict protection and climate goals, because we are actually uh, targeting those ecosystems that need the strict protection also for mitigation and adaptation purposes, as in the strategy, not, uh, not others. So just wanted to signal that indeed it's, all, uh, it's an issue of quality, the way they are managed, the effective management, also of quantity. Now, we do announce that some definitions will need to come in also to fine tune what are international definitions that we may wish to adapt to the EU context. That this includes, uh, for instance, uh, old growth forests, primary forests, strict protection, and OECMs. Too soon to say if they come in a single document or not, but we will certainly address these adequate definitions. And we absolutely cherish OECMs, so these other effective conservation measures, be it on land and on sea. Both protected areas and OECMs can deliver for biodiversity and for economic purposes, notably uh, on allowing uh, um, more, more fish. Um, I'm tempted just to tackle two or two, three topics that uh, Jürgen has raised. And one is on payment of ecosystem services, we are all on board, and I would even say you do know we have some pilots and projects ongoing with support with the parliament on results-based payment schemes that, in my view, are purely payment of ecosystem services, where we, for instance, can pay uh, farmers, if they so will, so it's voluntary, to deliver an extra crop, which is the butterfly or the bird or the nests. So we cannot apply this generalized, but to tell you that, to tell you that we are very much in favor of that. In terms of the landscape features versus the cap, of course, that can be uptaken through the, the new green architecture proposed of the CAP, including the ECHO schemes. It depends a lot, a lot of the will of the member states and the Commission will have also a role on trying to steer in that direction. And finally, I'm, I'm totally in favour of developing alternatives for chemical pesticides, a lot of which already exist actually, including on agroecological approaches. And even the precision farming can be linked to some of these alternatives, I think. And very finally, we are all on board on private land conservation, the role of landowners also from a voluntary point of view that we see expanding a lot also, also outside Europe, but in Europe there's a lot of margin for that. That's why we are supporting these life projects uh, as the one that Jürgen has referred. Sorry if I took a bit too long, but it, these were ideas that kept in my mind. Back to you, Jürgen. Thank you, Umberto, for this very elaborate and very clear um, answer. Um, I'm just checking with the other panelists whether they want to comment on anything that has been said with regard to the OECMs or the strictly protected areas or any other um, issue that has been raised by Umberto. I, I, yeah, I see Eric who wants to say something. Please go ahead. We will oh. we will unmute your cam. Yeah, we will unmute your microphone. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, I also wanted to react a bit on the investments because I think in the the presentation of Jürgen, it appeared as if I think since the 2010 the investment in nature and biodiversity has, has really increased a lot, which I think it's not necessarily the case, um, uh, both in terms of uh, I think since especially the financial crisis, 
there, there were lots of cuts in many member states on on basic nature protection. Uh, there's uh, in some countries really weak enforcement uh, in the field uh, monitoring uh, basic things to to make this work. So um, and also in terms of I think when you look at for example the the cap budget was significant and there was a significant share for um, nature and biodiversity but um, <clears throat> we recently contributed to a, an evaluation for DJ agriculture on the biodiversity impacts of the of the cap and there you see that a lot of this money was which was in principle uh, available uh, did not really ultimately benefit biodiversity with the ambition that it should so um, uh, just to make that note I think that um, um, the, the, the investment needs were clear in 2010 and they were not clearly not met um, um, and I would also really make the case for these large budgets that we have um, also in the new MFF for biodiversity to make them more uh, results based and, and uh, con voluntary fine but conditional on uh, con actual conservation outcomes um, and not just effort um, or area of land. Uh, yeah, um, that is all. Thanks a lot, um, Eric. Um, to allow a little bit of diversity of questions, and we I see, can see that we also have a few minutes delay, so I will move to the next question. Um, and I saw uh, basically a question for uh, Mr. Friedman. Um, if you could maybe share any lessons learned from the marine protected areas approach, um, that you think could be applied um, to the EU's terrestrial areas? Thanks very much. Um, my job has taken me through working in marine parks in, in wealthy countries of Australia and in the Pacific with the French um, territories. and the difficulty of putting in management that's completely covered by government is, even within these wealthy countries, to protect those areas is significant. And uh, we find more and more that some of the used stocks, for example, abalone stocks, very high value fishery stocks, are looked after by the community and the fishers because they believe the benefits from those are more obvious to them. So we just really need to look across the effectiveness of the types of interventions we're making um, to understand the return on investment. If we've got $10 to spend, are we getting $10 of results? Or are we at least moving towards adaptive management approaches that learn from the past? And I think that's, that, that's the key thing. So get everyone around the table because we need everyone here. We're not gonna do this with conservation alone and uh, get the community looking at the opportunity as an opportunity for them where they're welcomed in the conversation and that that's the job we need to do whether we're talking about strict protection areas or areas where people are in use sectors but have certain areas of their land which they don't use in the same way thanks a lot um maybe Jurgen, you want to react on this notion that indeed we need to get everyone around the table um, in your presentation, you also pointed to uh, the need for return on investment. So maybe you want to comment on what has been said. Well, yeah, I, I, I certainly think that that let's say if we are not capable of bringing all stakeholders around the table, then uh, it's going to be an extremely difficult. Well, it, it will be an extremely difficult uh, discussion anyhow, uh, even if you have everybody around the table. But 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 not having. Uh, everybody around the table would be a major mistake. But but I do think that, let's say, especially with, with a number of strategies which are now systematically brought together and running in parallel, that, let's say, we are looking forward that, that more and more uh, stakeholders, also stakeholders with very different mm -hmm. opinion, are brought together to, to have a serious discussion on how to reach certain targets as well on the side of farmers, as on the side of the environment, uh, as uh, on the side of, of the economic needs. Um, at the same time, we have to take care that, let's say, the instruments are following. 
And I think Eric just mentioned that, okay, since 2010, no major investment increasements. Well, that's, that's what we mean with, if you want to deliver quality, then you have to make sure that, that all of those elements are brought together and that, let's say, that there is also a, a financial support to realize this, uh, not only purely in the field of nature conservation, but let's say in, in each and every aspect of our daily life uh, in such a way that everybody can contribute to those goals we are now setting in the EU Biodiversity Strategy 2030. Okay, that's clear. And I see a lot of nodding. So it seems that other panelists also agree with what you say. Um, maybe um, if you allow me, I'll move to another question, which is one on... Uh, with respect to biodiversity on farmland, um, the special reports um, of the European Court of Auditors said on the 5th of June that the CAP contribution has not halted um, the decline. And so the question to the panelists is, what do you think of that? And do you expect that the future will be better um, in this respect? I don't know who wants to answer, just raise physically your hand and I'll, I will give you the floor. I see Umberto. I saw Umberto first. He was the quickest. <laughs> so, Umberto. Okay, so very quickly and starting on the issue of the cap. Well, that the cap was not enough to halt biodiversity loss on farmland is, uh, is an evidence from the fact that there's a sharp decline of the farmland biodiversity, including in the EU, insects and not only farmland birds and so forth. So, what Yaka said is the cap. The current cap, the current greening did not deliver. That's what the ECA is saying. The reply is, well, the new cap proposal. We, you may remember that when the farm to fork and biodiversity strategy were approved, they came together with a, a document from the commission analyzing if the cap proposal is or not aligned with the Green Deal. The conclusion being, yes, it is provided, and this is very important, also for MEPs, provided the level of ambition as proposed by the Commission is maintained or even reinforced, which at this stage is yet far from ensured. But that's the reply. The new approach to the, to the greening can make it much more meaningful, also because biodiversity is now one of the criteria. Uh, let me just, if I may, uh, profiting also to this, make this more lively, reacting on two, two topics. I fully agree on the issue of having all stakeholders around the table. That's my motivation since I am indeed in the Commission, but more specifically more in the in the Genvan also. But with this, I also want to say very clearly that it takes two to tango. So we also need all stakeholders to be willing to dialogue and be on board. Uh, nowadays, around uh, forest issues, the forest strategy, I see some stakeholders, and I see that uh, applies also to ELO, which are kind of reluctant to discuss forest in the nature and forest group. And I find that not the best approach in terms of stakeholder dialogue. And finally, I want to add something. There was a comment by Eric to something that Jürgen said, and I may compliment, which is, yes, the past strategies did not deliver. That's an evidence. It doesn't mean that everything failed. Huh? It just means that successes were outpaced by, by the rhythm of destruction, let's call it that way. The main element of this strategy is it has much more quantification. It addresses much more the sectors that underlie the drivers of loss, the direct drivers of loss, and it has much bigger political support, including in the public opinion. So these are the ingredients, I think, that can make the difference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will also take one more quick reaction from Eric. Um, we are a little bit delayed, so I would also like to ask our host, um, Alvaro Amaro, whether it is okay that he will conclude at 10 past six, so that we just have like 10 minutes delay um, so that we can have one more reaction and maybe one more question, um, but then we will conclude um, the conference. So I'm just asking whether it is okay for you that we will have, yeah, that we will conclude at 10 past um, six. I hope that will be okay. Um, and in the meantime, I will give the floor to Eric, maybe for a quick reaction on what Umberto has said. Yeah, it was a, a oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yes. Uh, it was a very beautiful summary, so I feel a bit bad now to still react on top, but uh, I, I think just to reinforce the point that there's a lot of good examples out there, and that uh, I think it's, I think the countryside stakeholders and the nature stakeholders, which have maybe traditionally been very opposed, I think have share uh, 
very big interest and I think both sides um, should go more often out of their Calimero complexes and, and work together and I think that's certainly true in relation to the cap. We give now more flexibility to member states which does make sense um, for some reasons but at the same time it's, it's risky and it will depend on then good cooperation and actually ownership also um, uh, between those different communities uh, in, in the capitals but also certainly in the regions. So, um, so I think that's my, my hopeful <laughs> uh, uh, conclusion uh, on, the, uh, on the Court of Auditor uh, report that uh, there is scope for, uh, for improvement so but then now it's also time to work together and deliver. I think that's a, a nice a nice way to conclude. Um, I have one more very short question um, and so I would like also a very short answer to that one but I think it's relevant to ask in the context of this intergroup and the question is um, what role does hunting play in the EU biodiversity strategy? So maybe just one quick reaction. Uh, I don't know Jurgen if you want to take um, this one um, before we conclude. Well let's say Hunting, hunting is, is one, one of those activities uh, which can play, if done in a durable way, uh, can have a very positive effect even uh, at the level of native conservation. Let's say um, hunters uh, are one of the partners in, in the countryside. Uh, it's, an, it's an activity which is broadly uh, uh, it's an activity which is broadly uh, available in the countryside and let's say when done in a durable way it's really contributing uh, to, uh, to to biodiversity and making sure that certain certain uh, equilibria are present uh, within within the countryside if i may i would just like to make a smart comment also on the report of the of the auditors uh, of the court of auditors uh, when they are saying that okay the the measures taken within uh, the cap are not halting the loss of farmland biodiversity, then that is clearly an objective way of looking at the figures. But we have also to say that, let's say, the period in which those measures uh, have been active in the field was also extremely short. And that, yeah, what we see over there is, a, is exactly the same what we see within with biodiversity investment. That if you look at them in a too short period, that it's very difficult to come to positive results. Thank you, Jürgen. Um, and um, well, I thank all the panelists here for their very insightful responses. Um, I will now give the floor back to MEP Alvaro Amoro for um, the closing remarks of this um, conference. So thanks a lot. Yeah, we, we can't hear you. We'll first um, unmute you. We, we will do that sorry. for you. I'm yeah. sorry. Okay, no problem. Thank you, dear Ilt, for uh, your excellent uh, moderation. Thank you uh, to uh, all of our uh, invitees. And uh, uh, it's very, very important. Tá bom, Dr. Humberto Rosa. É um prazer vê-lo. It's, uh, we are discussing uh, one of the most uh, important challenge for uh, all of us, all the world. It's very, very important. Uh, and I'm very glad to, to discuss in our inter, intergroup. Uh, it's for me a, a great pleasure. And, uh, and uh, I really hope you found this webinar of interest and that is point out the, the right challenges for the future. Uh, biodiversity, like our climate, has been under great pressure in the last decade, not only in Europe, but all of the world, as we know. That's why we are obliged to promote the change in order to live a better and viable planet for the coming generations to our children and the, the, our grandchildren. Solutions already exist, and we should remind that every day and everywhere in the Europe, in the Europe rural world, we find farmers, land managers, and hunters 
fighting biodiversity loss and leading biodiversity friendly initiatives with success sometimes sometimes through partnerships and promotion promoting networks on the ground where they are more needed actually we have heard about some of those initiatives today any strategy must have the structured involvement of all stakeholders in this in its implementation to succeed what is at stake are not just legitimate objectives for the protection and restore, restoration restoration of european fauna and flora we want to create a more resilient more integrated system that allows this hand simultaneously maintain or increase the income of those who depend on rural activities we must all be aware that in the long run desertified and demographically deprived regions with large areas of poorly managed or totally abandoned territories will not bring benefits to anyone and uh, this is this uh, risk that might occur in a newer future in our continent in europe the rural world and its different communities are ready to make change however those change if to come to come up with impact assessments and full involvement of land man of land managers farmers hunters and other interest stakeholders when proposing new requirements requirements a particular concern in this context context relates to nature conservation and the new designation objectives combined with strict protection measures we fear that this may represent an extremely st static vision of nature which might not solve the implementation issues in protect areas nor outside i believe there is also a need to discuss how to reward some of the stewardships of the land which is making a very positive contribution to biodiversity preservation the new cip the new cap will play an important role for sure but it will most probably not be sufficient for the ambitious goals forcing we do hope the european commission look at innovative finance mechanisms as the examples of umberto delgado mentioned discussed with the appropriate stakeholders which we could be ready to support we have covered today one of the strategies present by the commission last may we left on the side the debate related to the food system and agriculture as we have scheduled our next event to be about the farm to fork strategy and how it can help to deliver a sustainable future for european rural, rural areas the intergroup will also dedicate a meeting to forestry as this this sector will play a major role in the achievement for the eu biodiversity strategy and will be part of the eu strategic agenda with the new forest strategy will which will probably be present and be presented in the last quarter of this year be reassured the intergroup will continue debating on the eu strategies which are supposed to implement the eu green deal always with an open mind a pragmatic will and by promotion dialogue and encounter of all stakeholders again i would like to thank Again, our speakers, our moderator, and uh, our fantastic secretariat, the face and the yellow.
in the persons, in all of them, but in the persons of the Secretary General, David Scallon, and the Tierra scale, and of course, to everyone present at this meeting, particularly my colleagues and all the people that make the questions, very important questions, uh, they have followed the meeting online. My colleagues, Alex, Elsie, and uh, all of you, thanks again for having co hosted this event with me. Thank you for all. Keep safe. Um abraço. Dr. Roberto Rosa. Great thanks, Mr. Amara, for, um, for these closing remarks, for hosting the event, and great thanks to all the speakers, uh, all the participants um, to today's conference. And so, indeed, with this, we wish you a very happy evening, and we hope to see you next time. So, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Adios. Thank you. Adios. Adios. Bom abraço.